بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هنبدا آه النهارده الويبينار مع آه دكتور فينسنت موسكا هلو آه دكتور موسكا هلو ثانك يو سو ماتش فور اكسبتنج اور انفيتيشن تو بارتيسيبيت تو نايت ان اور ايجيبشن بيجاتيك اور سوبيدي سوسايتي ريجولار ويبينار وي ار ريلي فيري جلاد ذات يو اكسبتد اور انفيتيشن Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see now more than almost 100 participants. Ready? Uh, uh, we start our uh, webinar uh, tonight uh, by a memorandum of Professor Tarraf. Uh, I will speak in Arabic language uh, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we start our uh, uh, webinar with uh, Professor Mosca. في الحقيقه يعني الواحد يعني ما كانش متخيل ان انا ما كنتش متخيل ان انا في يوم من الايام ممكن اعمل حاجه زي كده او اتكلم عن بروفيسور طراف بعد رحيله الصدمه كانت رهيبه علينا كلنا انا عرفت بروفيسور طراف بدايه تعاملي معاه كان سنه 1997 لما اشتغلت في مستشفى بريش للاطفال درس مساعد زائر لمده سنتين واشتغلت تحت بروفيسور طراف في ابو الريش بيدياتريك اورثوبيدك يونت في جامعه القاهره وبعدين ابتدت علاقتنا ببعض بعد كده لما جيت مسافر بالتيمور البعثه بتاعتي بروفيسور طراف سجل في في الكورس بتاع بالتيمور وانا ابتديت البعثه بتاعتي بالكورس وبروفيسور طراف سافر معايا ونزلنا في نفس الغرفه في الفندق مع بعض لمده حوالي اسبوع ودي كانت بدايه صداقتنا ببعض الحقيقه يعني انا انا طبعا مش مش مؤهل ان انا اتكلم عن يعني حد بحجم دكتور يحيى وطبعا الزملاء في جامعه القاهره اولى مني بالحديث عن انجازات الدكتور يحيى بتاع انا مش سنه عشان اتكلم عن 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 ده خالص يعني. طبعا يعني الواحد يعني يعني حقيقي في وضع مش متخيل فعلا ان الواحد بيتكلم عن الدكتور يحيى بعد بعد وفاته لكن هنقول ايه؟ هي هكذا حال الدنيا أه بعد كده علاقتنا الحقيقه كصداقه امتدت على مدار السنين ده هي على تواصل مع بعض شبه يومي شبه اسبوعي بنتقابل بنتكلم في التليفون بناخد راي بعض في حالات كثيره هو بعد الكورس رجع مصر وانا ابتديت الفيلوشيب بتاعتي وصداقتنا امتدت على مدار السنين لغايه يوم وفاته كنت بكلمه في التليفون وكل حاجه الراجل كان كويس جدا ما فيش اي مشاكل صدمه كانت كبيره جدا جدا علينا كلنا الحقيقه دكتور يحيى يعني معروف ان هو بيحترم راي الاخرين حتى لو كان مخالف لرايه سواء في في الامور الطبيه او في الامور الحياتيه كان كان فعلا يعني شخص دمث الخلق جدا كان دايما مبتسم كان دايما عطوف دايما عنده عطاء للاخرين من شهرين ثلاثه لقيته بيكلمني على عامل شافه في نادي الجزيره عنده انفكتد نون يونيون بيكلمني يقول لي يا ياسر لو ممكن تشوف الراجل دوت لانه عمل عمليات كتيره وركب اجهزه في الظروف وبتاع لو ممكن تشوفه قلت له حضرتك ابعتوا لي العياده وهشوف بقيت ابعتوا لي العياده فعلا وبعدين لقيته بيتابع مش بس بي بي بيكلمني لا ده بيتابع الحاله وبيقول لي طب هتعمل له ايه ورايك ايه ونعمل ايه فهو يعني فعلا شخصيه غير عاديه دكتور يحيى شخصية غير عادية، عطاء عطاء بلا حدود، طيبة قلب، نقاء سريرة، فعلا مش موجودة عند أي حد. رب 
ربنا يرحمه يا رب ويغفر له دي كانت اثناء الصوره دي كانت اثناء مناقشه رساله الدكتوراه بتاعتي كان الكلام ده كان سنه 2000 في شهر يناير 2000 ده بروفيسور طراف وبروفيسور هاني حفني وموريزيو كاتامي من ماي ديورينج ماي ام دي فيسيس ديسكشن والصوره دي بعد مناقشه الرساله مباشره الكلام ده سنه 2000 الصورة دي كان في نفس اليوم بالليل طبعا ده كان في بيتي عزمت موريزيو كاتاني وبروفيسور طراف ومستر ماهر حلاوه ربنا يديله الصحه وطوله العمر الصورة دي كانت في شهر مارس 2021 يعني بعد 21 سنه Uh, برضو كان في جامعة الأزهر عندنا in, in our university during discussion of uh, uh, master degree thesis about uh, one week accelerated Bonzetti method بروفيسور uh, طراف جه uh, جامعة عندنا وناقش الرسالة ولبسنا نفس الأرواب بتاعتنا وكان يوم جميل جدا وكرمناه طبعا لأنه يعني شرف لينا أنه هو كان يعني يجي الجامعة ويناقش الرسالة عندنا الحقيقة وبنعتز جدا جدا بصداقته واستاذيته لينا كلنا يعني كتير اعلم ناس كتير عندنا في القسم بتاعنا ربنا يكرمه ربنا يرحمه ويغفر له يا رب بروفيسور طراف كان طبعا مشهور بالبوستات بتاعته ومعروف عنه حب مصر جدا ومعروف عنه قول الحق وما يراه انه حق بدون اي حساب لاي احد هو الراجل بيقول اللي في قلبه وبيقول اللي هو مؤمن بيه طبعا يعني معروف ان بروفيسور طراف يعني رياضي طول عمره كان بيلعب جولف وكان يعني بيمثل مصر دايما في بطولات الجولف وبيجري ماراثون لغايه يوم وفاته ربنا يرحمه كان كان في ماراثون في الجونه وبعد ما رجع مصر ودخل بيته وكده هو حصل الواقع ربنا يرحمه ويغفر له وما تدري نفس ماذا تكسب غدا وما تدري نفس باي ارض تموت نقرا الفاتحه لاستاذنا الله يرحمه استاذ الدكتور يحيى طرف نقرا له الفاتحه كلنا بعد اذنكم آه الحقيقه انا يعني نفسي ان احنا نعمل يوم كامل آه آه للدكتور يحيى طراف رساء للدكتور يحيى انا نفسي نعمل يوم كلنا ونقعد نتقابل كلنا ونتكلم فيه آه شكرا جزيلا ونبدا الويبينار بتاعنا ثانك يو سو ماتش اند We can uh, start our uh, webinar with uh, Professor Mosca, Dr. Khaled. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, everyone around. Uh, thank you uh, uh, to uh, join us in uh, this activity. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's our pleasure uh, to have you all. And uh, it's, uh, it's a great honor to have Dr. Uh, Mosca. Uh, Uh, in uh, this uh, uh, webinar, uh, um, and uh, this webinar uh, is uh, is mainly on the pediatric feeds. Uh, we'll uh, speak about the uh, flexible flat feed, uh, the tarsal coalition, and uh, the cavus feed. Uh, so, Dr. Mosca, I think he is having some technical issues here, but. Uh, I wanted to, uh, it's, uh, to introduce Dr. Mosca. Dr. Mosca is, uh, I've uh, I met Dr. Mosca in uh, 2010 uh, as I started uh, visiting his uh, center. Uh, he impacted my life and impacted my practice very much. Uh, uh, rather than he's a good surgeon, but he's a, 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 a very good teacher. So, 
with uh, without further ado so some of the housekeeping for this night that uh, we'll start with the presentation in the beginning and uh, we'll leave the questions uh, till the end uh, if you have any burning question uh, please uh, write it down in the chat room uh, and we'll uh, uh, um, answer it uh, accordingly at the end of the uh, webinar uh, um, in the beginning, we will start with the flexible flat feet, uh, and uh, then we'll shift to the tarsal coalition, and after this, we'll uh, end with the cavus feet as well. Uh, so, so Dr. Mosca is back now. So let me see. There. Okay. Okay. So, I, I, <laughs> so I'm not sure. asking about you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Khaled, and thank you, uh, Yasser. I have tried to share my screen, and it's coming up not so good. So, Khaled, I sent you okay. the presentation. Did you receive okay. it? So let me check the email. Yes. You have it? Yeah. Okay. So I'm downloading it. I should have thought of that a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that would work. Okay. So... So, I, I have known Khaled and Yasser for many years, um, seen them both in the United States and in Egypt, and uh, it's, they've been great friendships, great relationships. <clears throat> My area of interest in pediatric orthopedics is the child's foot. The assignment was a, a big task to try to talk about three major foot deformities in an hour because each one is about an hour lecture. So I tried to shorten them and uh, just give enough information to have them meaningful. Are you able to share the screen? So I was still, yeah, so I'm just I'm opening it now. Okay. So. And as an introduction, for many years, when I gave lectures locally, nationally, internationally, I spoke about foot deformities, and because that's what I treat. But it became very apparent to me that more important than how to treat them was how to understand them. And great. Um, so I'll just annoy everybody by saying, click, click, click. Um, but, and so could you put that in, in the yeah. large mode? Great, thank you very much. So I'll hide, so you still have all this notification here, right? Okay, so that, that looks good to me. So if you can advance it. So what became apparent to me after many years of just talking about deformities is that the child's foot is more complex than any other part of the child. Uh, especially the musculoskeletal system. And so it really came down to my belief that we need to understand the biomechanics of the foot. We need to understand how to assess foot deformities. And then based on our understanding of biomechanics and of assessment, then we can use algorithms to determine treatment. Again, with there were so many bones in the foot. There's so many joints and they can all move in different directions and have different deformities, that if we just say, I treat something this way, we're going to get it right sometimes, we're going to get it wrong more times. So one of my first principles is that the foot is not a joint. 
There are 26 bones with 19 major articulations, and most foot deformities have at least two deformities in different directions from each other. They're rotated. So if you look at the towel and you want to get the water out, you turn your hands in different directions. Next. Just next. 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 So if we wring the towel out this way, next. And then this is a foot on bungee cords, next. If we pronate the forefoot, next. And invert the hind foot, next. That's a cavo varus foot deformity, the rotationally opposite deformities, next. And if we wring out the towel the other way, next. and supinate the forefoot, next, and evert the hind foot, next, and then next. That's a flat foot. We've supinated the forefoot and everted the hind foot into valgus, rotationally opposite deformity. So when we understand this, we can understand why you can't do one procedure on a, a foot deformity and correct rotationally opposite deformities. You need to understand each of the deformities and have a plan for each one. Next. The subtalar joint is unlike any other joint in the body. Next. It's not a ball and socket joint like the shoulder or the hip. Next. And it's not a hinge joint like all the other joints in the body. Next. The axis of the subtalar joint is oblique and it's not in any of the orthogonal planes. So when the subtalar joint moves, next. It moves in, next, or out in the frontal plane, next and it moves up or down, next and next, in the sagittal plane. And these are combination procedures, moving in and out and up and down are combined. Next. <clears throat> next, that's hind foot varus, just like there can be varus at any other joint in the body. It's angled inward. The subtalar joint assumes a varus position by inversion. And inversion is a motion that includes plantar flexion down, next, and internal rotation in. So down and in, plantar flexion and internal rotation or inversion that lead to the static position of hind foot varus. Next. <clears throat> Next. Next. That's hind foot valgus, like genu valgus or hallux valgus. And the subtalar joint assumes valgus by eversion. Eversion is a combination of motions of the subtalar joint that includes next, dorsiflexion up, next, and external rotation out, next. So eversion is up and out of the subtalar joint. It dorsiflexes and externally rotates around the talus, next. Inversion is down and in. So just do next, next a few times here. Inversion is down and in. Eversion is up and out. One more time. Inversion is down and in, and eversion is up and out. So you can stop there. And, and so what we're showing here is that the subtalar joint does what the ankle joint does. It goes up and down. It dorsiflexes and plantar flexes. But the ankle joint only goes up and down. The subtalar joint goes up and down, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, in combination with rotation, inward and outward. It's so important to know this because when we assess foot deformities, many of them are painful because of a tight heel cord. Well, the heel cord is limiting dorsiflexion. And we need to differentiate before surgery and then treat during surgery where is the contracture? Where is the limitation of dorsiflexion? Is it in the ankle joint? Is it in the subtalar joint or is it in both? And this is the basis of the silver scale test where we separate and isolate contracture of the gastrocnemius alone versus the entire heel cord. So just remember, subtalar joint goes up and down or doesn't, and we need to differentiate these when we're treating foot deformities. So we, number one, don't forget to lengthen what's tight behind the ankle. And if we're going to lengthen what's tight behind the ankle, differentiate whether it's the entire tricep surrey or only the gastrocnemius. This, this biomechanics is just so important. And I simplify it to down and in and up and out rather than the bigger words of plantar flexion, et cetera. Next. Next. Flat feet are normal. 
23% of adults, almost one out of a quarter, have have flexible have flat feet. And of those, two-thirds are nor- have flexible flat feet. Normal shape, no pain, no disability. They're just flat. Next. Of the 23% of a flat-footed adults, about a quarter of them have the same flexibility of their flat feet, but they have short or tight Achilles tendons. Those hurt. So without a tight Achilles tendon, a flexible flat foot, very, very common, two-thirds of the one-quarter of adults who have flat feet, they don't hurt. But if you add a tight Achilles tendon, they hurt, usually starting in adolescence. Next. And the remainder of the 23% of flat-footed adults have rigid flat feet, most of which are tarsal coalitions. But what we know about tarsal coalitions, I'll talk about later, is that most of them don't hurt. Having a tarsal coalition doesn't give you um, pain except maybe 25% of the time. What else do we know about flat feet? Well, most babies are flat-footed. And these two charts are footprints. The other is a lateral x-ray, Mary's angle. Higher on the chart are flatter feet, lower on the chart are arched feet, and it's age along the bottom axis. So most babies are flat-footed. With time, doing nothing but letting the kids grow, by the time they're about 10, 90% of kids who are flat-footed become 23% of adolescents and adults who are flat-footed. That's the natural history of it. And when you look at the range of how flat flat is, there's a really broad range. Two standard deviations shows that, yes, the average is 90% of flat-footed, then less, but there's a broad range of normal foot shapes. It is what it is. Flat foot is normal. It's not a disease, especially if it's not associated with a tight Achilles tendon. Natural history is the arch will develop, leave babies alone. And there's a wide range of normal. Next. And there's no evidence whatsoever that anything you do to a baby's or child's foot is going to change the height of the arch. If you put inserts in their shoes from the minute they start walking, there's about a 70% chance they're going to have an arch because that's the natural history. If you didn't put the arch support in, there's still a 70% chance that they'd have an arch. But no evidence shows that putting anything in the child's foot, the flat-footed baby, is going to affect the natural history. 23% will remain flat-footed. The other 75% will have more of an arch. Next. So there are flexible flat feet with short Achilles tendons that hurt. Next. And they may have pain under the medial midfoot. Next. And next. Next. Or they have, next, where they may have impingement type pain in the sinus tarsi region. This is what the tight Achilles tendon does. It prevents the ankle from dorsiflexing. It forces the subtalar joint into further eversion, and it, and it presses the head of the talus onto the ground. So that's why with a flexible flat foot, there's no pain. If there's a tight Achilles tendon, it forces the subtalar joint to do things that it wouldn't have to do if it were not contracted, therefore the pain. Next. Next. Well, if the short tendon Achilles is the problem, why don't you stretch it? It's hard to stretch a tight Achilles tendon in a flexible flat foot because if you just put your foot behind you, lean against the wall, you will further evert the subtalar joint. The subtalar joint is cheating. It's going around the corner and it's everting to dorsiflex rather than stretching the Achilles tendon. The only way to stretch a tight Achilles tendon in someone with a flat foot is to invert the subtalar joint, like with this rubber model, that will invert the subtalar joint. Then the subtalar joint cannot evert next. And any dorsiflexion has to be at the ankle by stretching the tendo Achilles. If you have an average arch or a high arch, You can just put your foot on the ground, straighten your knee, lean forward, and stretch it. If you have a flat foot, you have to invert and lock the subtalar joint and then stretch, and then you're stretching the heel cord and not just further everting the subtalar joint. It's hard to do. It's even I know how to do it. It, It's hard to do, especially for a child, but we try to do that. Next, the last thing you would ever want to do in a painful flat foot with a tight Achilles tendon is to put an orthosis in. Next. The talus can't dorsiflex because the Achilles tendon is too tight. And that's just the way it is. So if you put some hard plastic orthotic arch support, all it's going to do is put more pressure under the head of the talus, cause more callus, more pain formation. It's just going to make the feet hurt more. You can't do that. Now, you can add just a cushion in a shoe 
to take some of the stress off the midfoot if the Achilles tendon is tight, but you cannot put a molded arch support in. You'll make them worse. Next. So what's left? If they hurt, you can't stretch the Achilles tendon. They still hurt. It's surgery. Next. There have been so many procedures described over the decades to treat painful flat feet, soft tissue releases, tendon transfers. They don't work. Next. Removing bones. I don't think so. Next. Interposing materials in the sinus tarsi. Next. These are the so-called arthroresis, arthroresis procedures. In the United States, podiatrists put these in. In the United States, orthopedic surgeons take them out because they cause pain. In other countries, especially parts of Europe, um, orthopedic surgeons are putting them in, and they come in different styles, different designs, different materials. All the short-term follow-up studies say they work and they're really simple to put in. Next. But they cause pain in at least... Next. Okay, next, next slide. They cause pain in at least... Um, actually, go back one more. They cause pain in at least 30% of cases. And in some cases, the podiatrist are putting them in painless, flexible, flat feet... But pain is a real problem, and, and when they come out, the, the pain sometimes doesn't go away. So until further notice, most, almost all pediatric orthopedic surgeons in the U.S. do not use these to correct flat foot deformities. The complications rate too high, and they cause damage to the subtalar joint. Next. Another pr possible procedure is arthrodesis. Next. We know that the subtalar joint is the shock absorber of the foot and the entire lower extremity. We're not going to fuse the subtalar joint in a normal child with a flat foot. Uh, cerebral palsy, maybe, but not a normal child. Next. So that leaves osteotomies for the painful flat feet with tight Achilles tendons that don't respond to heel cord stretching. Next. So now the concept of the acetabulum pedis. Next. In 1818, Scarpa from Italy um, thought about the subtail joint as a hip joint. So he called it the acetabulum pedis, the acetabulum of the foot rather than the acetabulum of the hip. And he saw the subtail joint as a socket in which sits the femoral head. And you can see what he thought was the socket. Next, I read the translation, and this is the way I think he thought about it. At the hip, next, there's an acetabulum pelvis. And in the foot, next is the acetabulum pedis. Next. In the hip, the ball rotates within the socket. Next. And in the foot, the socket, next, rotates around the ball. So similar concept. And this is three-dimensional. I'm just showing two dimensions for this. But it's a pretty good analogy, even though the hip is a true ball and socket, and the subtail joint is a modified, we don't even know what to call it because there's nothing else like it. But it's, a, it's an okay analogy for this. Next. The calcaneal lengthening osteotomy to correct flat foot deformities takes advantage of this concept though. If you look at the x-ray in the upper left, that's acetabular dysplasia. Next, it's got a, a low center edge angle of Viberg. It's not subluxated, it's just dysplastic. And so on the sketch below that I helped the artist draw, I drew a flat foot with a low center edge angle of the foot. Next, the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy. And next, three-dimensionally, next, rotates the acetabulum around the femoral head. And both in this next and in this plane, it corrects the center, of, center edge angle. And actually, three-dimensionally, it rotates it in other directions, not just the frontal plane. Next. Well, the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, so another one and then another one. Calcaneal lengthening osteotomy does the same thing three dimensionally. Next. It rotates the next, the navicular into the proper relationship in the head of the tail. I'll go back one, please. So in this plane, you can see just like at the hip, the, the center edge angle has been corrected. And what you can't see in these particular images is that in the other plane, the, the deformity has also been corrected. In the foot, the sag is no longer sagging. At the hip, the, the, the acetabulum has been rotated appropriately over the head. So this is a great analogy, and it shows why something like the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy is so appropriate to correct deformity at the site of deformity, particularly in a flat foot. Next. 
Uh, some people choose a posterior calcaneus osteotomy to correct flat foot deformity. But whereas the calcaneal lengthening corrects the deformity at the site of the deformity, the posterior calcaneus osteotomy, I consider the Chiari, just like we have the Chiari over the hip that's compensatory, whereas the Salter is a primary deformity corrector in the foot. Next, there's the next, there's the acetabulum pedis, next, and next, and next. So there's normal hind foot alignment, valgus hind foot, next, next, next. And I think we have one more next. Okay, so actually, so go back. Um, so the posterior calcaneus osteotomy moves the calcaneus over so that when you look at the individual from behind, you don't see the hind foot valgus, but the posterior calcaneus osteotomy does nothing whatsoever to alignment at the tailonavicular joint. And the tailonavicular joint is where the pathology is. That's where the pain is. That's where the callus formation is. That's where the malalignment is. And the posterior calcaneus osteotomy does nothing at the tailonavicular joint. So it's compensatory, like my analogy that this is the Chiari rather than the Salter, and the calcaneal lengthening is the Salter. Next. So the Evans concept, he didn't describe how to do it, and that's why from 1975 when he wrote up his concept, but no details, nobody could get it right, and nobody did it. In 1995, I wrote up my interpretation of his concept with a lot of details, and I found that it corrects all components of even severe valgus e eversion deformity of the hind foot at the site of deformity. Next. It relieves symptoms of pain. Next. Restores function. Next. Avoids arthrodesis. Preserves growth. Next. And it's had the best long-term reported outcomes for any procedure to correct painful flat feet. Um, it, it just hands down is the best reported outcome studies on correcting painful flat feet in adolescents and children. Next. So what are the indications for surgery? This is really, really important. Severe valgus eversion of the hind foot with failure to relieve the pain under the tailor head or in the sinus tarsi by non-operative measures, basically trying to stretch the Achilles tendon, and maybe that'll work. If it doesn't work, don't go with the hard arch support if the pain can't be relieved by stretching the Achilles tendon, then surgery. Next. And as I said, the surgery that has been shown to be the best is the calcaneal lengthening. I've written in many places, including my seminal article in JBJS in 1995. It's really detailed in my book from uh, 2014. And there are other chapters and other books that I've written. The details really matter. If you don't do all the details, it's not going to turn out well. So you have to correct the valgus eversion, calcaneal lengthening. You have to correct the contracture of the gastroc or tricep surgery because that's what caused the pain in the first place. And halfway through the operation, the supinated forefoot, which is always present as another deformity, either spontaneously corrects in the younger kids or it remains sup uh, rigidly supinated and you have to correct it before you leave the operating room. So next so these are all, all these nine points are absolutely critical. If you leave any of them out, you will not have excellent results. You'll have pretty good, but if you want consistently excellent results, each of these nine steps has to be observed. And they're not that, 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 that hard, and they're, they don't take very much time, but you need to do them. Or if your results are not very good, you can't blame my technique because I've been writing about this since 1995, at least seven publications. Everything matters. You can't skip points. That's why Evans didn't describe any of these. He just said length and lateral column, and nobody could make it work. Well, if you do my procedure, my technique of his concept, and you leave some of these out, it'll work most of the time, but it'll work every time if you do all of these. Next. The incision, important. It's, it's cosmetic and it's extensile. You have to lengthen the lateral soft tissues. If you're gonna lengthen the bone, the soft tissues might not let you. Next. The location of the osteotomy, don't cut through the middle facet, cut between the two facets. Next. Next. 
this calcaneal cuboid joint would like to subluxate when you're distracting the fragments. That's where Evans really went wrong. And I described putting a wire in there to prevent it from subluxating. So you will not get painful subluxation. You'll get full deformity correction. This is a critical step. It cannot be ignored. Next. It's, this is not an angular deformity correction with a triangle. It's a trapezoid because the cora is not in the calcaneus. The cora is in the talus, but we're cutting the calcaneus. So it has to be a trapezoid, not a triangle. Next. And when the hind foot eversion is corrected, the soft tissues on the medial side of the subtalar joint are redundant. So plicate them, remove the extra capsular tissue, Z shorten the, the tibialis posterior. Next. And that's supplemental. It's not in and of itself a correction for flat foot, but it's supplemental to the deformity correction with the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy. Next. In the middle of the operation, after you've performed the hind foot correction, either the, the plane of the metatarsals will be perpendicular with the tibia or would be rigidly supinated. If it's supinated, you have to correct it because otherwise the child will stand up on the fifth metatarsal head and the calcaneus and the, and the hind foot will collapse and then the correction will be lost. You need to create a tripod. If you see this, the picture in the middle, in the middle of surgery, you need to perform a medial cuneiform osteotomy to pronate the supinated forefoot. Next. Next. And so there you can see now the metatarsal heads are perpendicular with the hind foot. And then obviously you need to lengthen the Achilles tendon or the, or the gastrocnemius, whichever is tight. So those are all the procedures. You can't leave anything out, but you can get excellent results if you do all of them. Next. And that's, that's the word on flat feet. Most of them are normal. Don't treat normal. If they're painful, they're painful because they have a tight heel cord. Try to stretch the heel cord. If that's not successful, then the calcaneal lengthening and all these other associated procedures are the best way to manage it. Next. I'm, I'm gonna, just because I don't know exactly how long this is gonna take right now, but um, let, me, let me keep moving and we can save, right now if you have questions, save them for the end. How about tarsal coalitions? Not much time to talk about all of these topics, I, I thought I'd focus on the subtalar coalition and not the calcaneum navicular. For decades, back to 1980, the focus in managing tarsal coalitions has, of sub, subtalar joint has been on the size of the coalition. And that was based on some really poor science, really poor, um, quote, research that was done. And, and I think it set us back a long way. In 1945, Harris and Beeth from Canada, who gave us the information about how many people are flat-footed, that 23%, they also studied tarsal coalitions, and they said, if you have a painful coalition, perform a triple arthrodesis. That was 1945. 1980, there was an article by, by Pierce Scranton who said, no, if, this, if the coalition is big, then do a triple. If it's small, resect it. But again, the data was poor. So next slide. Here's what we know, that some articles say 2 to 5% of people have coalitions. Next. There's actually some research in cadavers showing that up to 13% of people have tarsal coalitions. That's one out of eight. That's a lot of people. The reason we don't know about them is that most tarsal coalitions don't hurt, just like most flat feet don't hurt, flexible flat feet. And it doesn't matter what percentage or one lo location or another, but the two most common locations for coalitions are calcaneo-navicular and talocalcaneal. Next. So why treat them? Next. It's because some kids with coalitions experience the insidious onset of activity-related pain. So it's insidious onset, activity-related pain, rarely beginning before age eight. And if they're going to become painful, it's usually between ages eight and 16 years. That's when they become painful. They're genetically predetermined, but they're not rigid coalitions at birth. They undergo metaplasia from scar tissue to cartilage 
to solid bone. And it's in that metaplastic phase between ages 8 and 16 that those that are going to become painful become painful. Next. Next. The goal then is not, since most of them don't hurt, the goal is not to remove coalitions. It's to relieve pain if they hurt, and you can't stop the pain any other way. Next. So we treat only the symptomatic ones. Next. And as it turns out, studies suggest that only about one out of four coalitions hurt. If they don't hurt, they don't matter. Next. If they hurt, then what do you do? Well, there are some studies suggesting that activity modification, perhaps the time non-weight bearing, perhaps some time in a boot, maybe even some time in a cast, can eliminate the pain. So if three quarters don't hurt, one quarter hurt, studies are suggesting if you take the painful one out of four feet with coalitions and immobilize them or do these other methods, you can stop the pain, then you don't need to surgically treat a coalition. Next. The operative indication then is failure to relieve the pain by trying really hard to relieve the pain non-operatively. Next. Where's the pain? This is absolutely critical because pain from tarsal coalitions can be in different locations. And the implications of the site or sites of pain is directly related to what you do for it. So the sites of pain and the, and the physiology of pain are varied and poorly understood, and they're rarely reported. Most people just say, painful tarsal coalition. It, that doesn't help me at all whatsoever. I treat based on symptoms and imaging, not just on imaging. Next. Pain may be at or adjacent to the syndesmosis or synchondrosis. Next. Next. So there may be pain at the, syn the synchondrosis, the cartilaginous coalition, under the medial malleolus for the tail calcaneal, or in the sinus tarsi area for calcaneal navicular. Another place for pain would be in adjacent joints. If the subtail joint isn't moving well, there will be stress transfer to adjacent joints that can lead to degenerative arthritis. So that would be pain related to the coalition by stress transfer to other joints. That never, ever, ever happens in kids. It may be an effect of, of young or older adults, but kids never get stress transfer to their other joints. They, they haven't walked on them enough. They're not fat enough. They, they just don't get it. So next Next. The third reason for pain, if it's not at the synchondrosis and if it's not at adjacent joints that are stressed, it could be due to the, to the deformity. We just talked rec recently about how flexible flat feet with tight Achilles tendons hurt under the midfoot and they hurt from impingement in the sinus tarsi. Well, rigid flat feet can do the same things. They're, they have tight Achilles tendons, they're flat, the ankle wants to dorsiflex, and they can get pain in the same locations as the flexible flat foot with tight Achilles tendon. So it's due to the deformity, not the coalition, to the deformity. Next. So that would be under the, there. Next. And impingement in the sinus tarsi. Those are three reasons for pain. And I'll say that the, the adjacent joint stress transfer, not in kids not going to happen. It's either going to be number one, yellow, or it's going to be number three, black. So flexible and rigid flat feet with short Achilles tendons can have pain due to the deformity. Next. Again, critical to, to, to ask, where is your pain? Next. And remember, why do we fuse joints? We fuse joints in adults because they're degenerate, because they hurt, because there's no cartilage there anymore. So, and why do we do that? Because we know that if there's no arth, arth means joint. If there's no arth, there can be no arthritis. Well, a coalition, a solid bony coalition is an arthrodesis. A coalition that is turned from 
sin desmosis to sin chondrosis to sin osteosis bone. It can't hurt. There's no joint there. It can't hurt. So typically in the coalitions that are solid bone, the pain is from the deformity, not from the coalition. Next. What are the treatment options for coalitions? We can resect and interpose a grafting material. We can perform triple orthodesis. We can do isolated fusions, or we can perform osteotomies. Next. Wild and Tarot in the group in Melbourne, Australia, wrote this seminal article in 1994. They looked at CT scans and critically looked at them, and they found that there were three criteria to determine whether a coalition can or should be resected versus performing a triple orthodesis. And those are their only two choices, either resect it or perform a triple. Next, they said it's appropriate to resect and fat graft a coalition if it's not very big. And they, they said, look through all the CT slices and relate the size of the coalition to the size of the posterior facet. And if it's small, that's one indication to consider resection. Next, people stopped reading after that. Um, next. But they also said what's important is how healthy is the posterior facet? If the posterior facet is thick here, comparable perhaps to the thickness of the ankle joint, it would make sense to remove the middle facet coalition and establish motion in the healthy posterior facet. Next. They also said, though, that what's important is to consider, next, hind foot deformity. Next. Next, right, and so stop there. Um, and so they said it's appropriate to resect and fat graft the coalition if it's if the coalition isn't too big based on the CT measurements, if the posterior facet is thick and healthy, and if there's not much deformity. It's not a flat foot. And they said 16 degrees of hind foot dalgus defined flat foot. So this would be next. This would be a resectable coalition. Next. Next. So just, just just click through here just really quickly. This is how I, I do it. There's the coalition. There's the flexor moved up. Just keep moving along. There you can see the synchondrosis. After resection, there's eversion, inversion, and keep going. And you can see it looks like we've established motion. Next. And then here we can see that with the resection cavity, I have a lamina spreader in place. And after resecting the coalition, I found the posterior facet. You can see those really nice, thick cartilage surfaces of the talus and the calcaneus. And with the lamina spreader in place, I've distracted it and shown that, yes, I can separate the bones by at least three or four millimeters. That pretty much says that the joint is moving. But what is really convincing to show that there's no other surrounding obstructions to motion next is to put two wires in, one in the talus and one in the calcaneus, and then invert and evert the subtalar joint. This really proves not only that I can distract the joint, but that I can invert and evert. So run through these. Next. That's subtalar motion, and we've confirmed it. Okay? So yes, distraction, but since you're there anyway, put two wires in, invert and evert, and the wires will convince you that, yes, there's nothing else that's obstructing uh, motion. Next, so we put a little wax in, take some fat from a thigh, and all these kids these days have plenty of fat to give, uh, and then close it up. Next. Now, so Wild and Throat, I, I like their indications for resection. I think they're spot on. But they said then the alternative is if you don't have, if you have a really large coalition, next. Next. And if the posterior facet is narrow, next. Look how much thinner the posterior facet is than the ankle joint. Next. And if you have a lot of deformity, which they define next as greater than 16 degrees of valgus from perpendicular to the ankle, next, that this should be a triple arthrodesis. Well, wow, there's nothing in between resecting it and performing a triple, because typically pain in these feet is due to the deformity and not from the coalition. And the subtalar joint is fused anyway. So, so why take show parts joints to add to the triple arthrodesis? Next. We, again, we said this before. If you take away 
the, all the triple joints, the ankle joint cannot last very well. It's just not designed to do what the subtalar joint had been doing. Next. 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 This is what we typically think about as subtalar motion. On the left, flexible flat feet. Next. In toe standing. Next. The hind foot goes into varus because of the windlass effect. Next. In a rigid flat foot, next, in toe standing, the hind foot remains in valgus. The subtalar joint doesn't move. Next. Next. So here it is again. That's what we expect from a tarsal coalition. It doesn't move in toe standing. It doesn't reverse from valgus to varus. Look at this foot. Stop there. Too many toes sign. Valgus hind foot becomes varus hind foot. Next. That's that foot. Isn't that amazing? It, it's got a solid, gigantic coalition. You can barely see the posterior facet. How does that happen? That's that foot. Next. Next. And next. So this is showing the wrong way to assess subtalar motion. Next. And I'm going to point out an arrow. Yeah, next. That bump is the beak of the calcaneus. What happened in this foot is that Chopart's joints developed hypermobility. The tail of the beak of the joint is supposed to move, but the calcaneus cuboid joint is supposed to be a potential joint. It's not supposed to move, no more so than the navicular cuneiform joint or the first metatarsal cuneiform joint. It's just supposed to be a potential joint. Next. But in some feet with tarsal coalitions, subtalar coalitions, the calcaneal cuboid joint develops hypermobility. Next. Next. And then run through these a little bit. Back and forth. It opens up like a book. Next. And so look at that. And stop there. That is hypermobility at show parts joints. From the outside, it looks like subtalar motion. And you remember back a few slides ago where the foot looks so flat, toe standing, it looked like the hind foot went into inversion, but it couldn't have been at the subtalar joint because it's fused by the coalition. It's this hypermobility at Chopard's joints that makes it appear that the child has subtalar motion when, when she didn't. Well, then you think to yourself, isn't that fantastic? The ankle joint can rest assured that Chopart's joints are trying to pr protect it, it being the ankle joint, from an added stress from the subtalar coalition. So subtalar coalition is going to stress the ankle. In this case, Chopart's joints are protecting the ankle because they developed hypermobility and the ankle doesn't feel the stress that it would otherwise. If, if you then choose in this situation, to perform a triple arthrodesis, the ankle takes all the, all the stress that it shouldn't have to take. Instead, why not reorient the foot so that Chopard's joints can continue to work and continue to protect the ankle joint? Next. So why fuse it? Next. Especially when the pain is from the deformity, not from the coalition. Next. So, we reorient them. Next. The calcaneal lengthening osteotomy has been shown both, we did some work in the lab, and then I've also done this in, in patients, to show that because the osteotomy is anterior to the middle facet, flat foot deformity, E version of the hind foot, is corrected with the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, whether the subtalar joint is flexible or rigid. Flexible or rigid. So, Talked before, painful flat foot, tight Achilles tendon, calcaneal lengthening, bingo. But if the pain in a tarsal coalition, an unresectable or even resectable coalition, is from the deformity, you can perform the same osteotomy without resecting the coalition and the deformities are corrected. And then you preserve Chopard's joints so they can continue to, to protect the ankle joint. Next. 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 
pain was primarily there, just like in a flexible flat foot. Next. And there was also some sinus torsi impingement pain, just like a flat foot, a flexible flat foot. But it was not a resectable coalition. You can see by the CT scan on the right. Big, big coalition, narrow posterior facet, and tons of deformity. Next. Next. And next. Next. And next. So uh, in this case, did not resect the coalition, just the deformity correction and lengthen the heel cord. Next. Next. Um, next. I think it's frozen. Uh, it's advanced. It's advancing now. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So at five years follow up, this foot had a, a, a foot ankle score of 94 out of 100. And that was all you can go back for a minute. And it, there was no subtalar motion. 94 out of 100 is about as good as you can get with anything. Um, no subtalar motion, but the deformity was corrected. The pain was fantastic. It was, it was gone. <clears throat> we also find some feet with coalitions um, where there's a lot of deformity. Next, if we resect the coalition. Next. There we go. So if we resect the coalition in a very flat foot, the tension band is removed and the feet get flatter. Next. Next. So this is one in which um, somebody else resected the coalition. It seemed like the right thing to do. And a few years later, <coughs> maybe a year or so later, the foot got flatter. So I did a calcaneal lengthening after the fact, and next, and it 15 years later, um, had good subtalar motion, had full deformity correction, and a foot score of 97 over 100. That's essentially a normal foot. It was done in a staged fashion, uh, and I'll show you in a minute that actually resection and deformity correction can be performed simultaneously. Next. Pain and flat pain and feet with tarsal coalitions can be due to the coalition or to the hind foot valgus deformity or a combination of both, and they usually have a tight Achilles tendon. The calcaneal lengthening osteotomy can correct all components of hind foot valgus, relieve pain, improve function in flexible as well as rigid painful flat feet. Next. That's his next. Next. So there are three basic patterns, and I wrote this up in an article in 2012 in JBJS, and I've continued to add more and more cases that confirm the reliability of this algorithm. If the foot is of normal shape and the posterior facet is healthy and thick, then one next. <laughs> resects the coalition and grafts it with fat. No deformity, healthy posterior facet. You just love, the foot looks good, hurts. We can resect the coalition and things, life is good. Next. Next. So that would be this situation. Next. Next. And next. And next one more. Good. The second scenario is one in which the coalition is still cartilaginous. It hurt. They hurt right there. The posterior facet is thick and healthy, but they have a lot of hind foot valgus deformity. That would be like the last case I showed of somebody else resected it. Um, but here we can do them simultaneously. Next, we can resect the coalition and fat graft it. And next, we do immediate and concurrent deformity correction. Next. 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 So we do the resection. Next. And next. 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 So a standard calcaneal lengthening osteotomy and all the associated procedures that go with it. Is there four foot supination? 
tight Achilles tendon. So do all the things one would do in conjunction for a flat foot deformity in conjunction with resecting and fat grafts in the coalition. The third scenario is this coalition shouldn't be resected. The posterior facet could never move anyway. If you resected that coalition, the posterior facet is almost fused and it might actually become painful because it has radiographic arthritis. It's a narrow joint. That's radiographic arthritis. The, the child didn't have clinical arthritis, which means joint pain because it couldn't move. So in this case, ignore the coalition because the pain is from the deformity and just perform deformity correction, like the previous case I showed. Next. And next. So, so three typical scenarios of subtilar coalitions. Normal shape, resectable coalition, resect the coalition. Resectable coalition with a flat foot, resect the coalition, correct the deformity. And lastly, unresectable, no way you can resect that coalition and expect that the rest of the joint is going to be happy. So just ignore the coalition, treat the deformity with deformity correction. So it's not just about the size of the coalition. And in every scenario, if the heel cord is tight, lengthen it. Next. And I would have to say, I don't think there's an indication for triple arthrodesis in a, a child or adolescent with a, with a coalition. They, they don't need to have short parts joint sacrificed. Next. So I think, are we doing okay? We have about another 15 minutes or so? Yeah. Okay. Um, then let me just move on to the cable varus foot. And this is the one that really is, this is like a two hour seminar, but I'll try to put it in about 15 minutes. Next. As described earlier, it's rotational deformity. Next. And next. And next. So rotational deformity, the forefoot is pronated. The hind foot is inverted into varus. All the metatarsals are on the ground. That doesn't mean that the forefoot isn't pronated. The forefoot is pronated in relationship to the hind foot. Because when we talk about pronation, supination, varus, valgus, abduction, adduction, we talk about one part in comparison to the next most proximal part. So if you look at the sketch on top, You'd say all the metatarsals are on the ground. Where's the pronation? It's next, it's pro the forefoot is pronated in relationship to the hind foot. Next and next. Yeah, so there's the pronation of the forefoot. It's in relationship to the hind foot. And the hind foot in standing is in varus. That's why you don't see it. The deformity is there. Next, you see it with the block test. Next, next. And again, okay. When we get x-rays to evaluate kibbovirus foot deformities, well, let me set from the outside. Flat feet are flat feet. You're born with them and they may or may not develop an arch or you get a flat foot associated with a tarsal coalition. But kibbovirus foot deformities are never idiopathic. They're always the result of a neuromuscular disorder. Most typically, Schrockermy tooth disease and the other neuromuscular uh, conditions in that family, spina bifida, um, perineal nerve injury. Cavalier's foot deformity that's progressive is due to something, a tethered cord. It's due to something else. So the foot is not the problem. The foot becomes the problem because of the neuromuscular disorder. And we need to understand why the foot is developing the shape. And if it's a treatable condition, like a tethered cord, do surgery on the tethered cord. If we identify that the condition is Schrockermary tooth disease, well, there's no treatment for Schrockermary tooth. So we can proceed with correcting the painful and disabling cable varus foot. But we would hate to spend all this time correcting the cable varus foot while the tethered cord is taking away bowel and bladder control or a spinal cord tumor is creating havoc. So that's why before treating cable varus feet, we have to investigate and figure out why. Hopefully it's Charcomary tooth disease. And then we just treat the foot and we don't have to do anything else about the, the spine. Well, we get standing in AP and lateral x-rays, next and next. There you can see that the, the foot cora is what I have de described, isn't it? Is the tail and navicular joint, that's the definition of varus. And on the lateral, we can see that on the 
lateral standing x-ray of every cable varus foot, the foot cora is in the medial kinear form. That's the site of angular deformity. It's not in the metatarsal. It's in the medial kinear form. Cavus is in the medial kinear form. Next. And you can do the Coleman block test, which would be the left two photos, and say, yeah, you know what? It looked like it was in varus, and now it's in valgus. Or next, you could do the same block test on x-ray next, and you can confirm next that yes, the hind foot is flexible. And I've confirmed that because parallel tails and first metatarsal is a straight foot compared with the adducted first metatarsal and talus, which is the definition of varus. You can look through the skin, or you can do the same thing on x-ray with the block under the lateral forefoot and confirm that the hind foot is or is not flexible. This is a flexible hind foot. Next. So what's the natural history of cable varus? Well, the deformities increase over time because it's a, due to progressive muscle weakness and imbalance. Flexible deformities over time become rigid. Rigidity increases complexity and the difficulty of reconstructing the deformities. So there are few, if any, indications for non-operative management. The only reason to delay operating on cable varus foot deformities is to work them up. I send them all to neurologists. I know how to work them up. I send them all to my pediatric neurologist and ask him or her to find out why, why this is happening. And then send back to me if it's just my condition or send them to the neurosurgeons first. Next, so there's no point in sending them to physical therapy or hiding them in shoes or hiding them in braces. Over time, the deformity is going to get worse, more rigid, and more difficult to manage. Next. Back to biomechanics. De correcting deformity will not correct muscle imbalance, and muscle imbalance was the primary problem. Next. Transferring tendons is important to prevent recurrent deformities, but tendon transfers don't correct structural deformities. They're two different things. They're related, but they're two different things. Next. So reconstruction of cable bearer's foot deformities involves next. Correction of the deformities, and there are usually at least two. And next. Balancing muscle forces. And there are often several muscle transfers that are necessary. Next. And this often, because there's so much to do, requires two operations about two weeks apart. It's just the soft tissues can't tolerate everything at once in most cases. Next. Correcting the foot deformities without balancing the muscles will result in recurrence of the deformity. Next. Balancing the muscles without correcting the deformities will result in well-balanced deformities. But we don't want well-balanced deformities. We want well-balanced, well-corrected foot shapes. So there's a lot going on. Uh, and the deformities and muscle balance is again related, but they're different things. Next. The principles of deformity correction. Again, there, there are so, the algorithms for cable virus foot are, are so great. I'm only gonna give a few, few principles, the details, uh, again, there's this well spelled out in my book, and um, and it has to be read rather than given in a lecture next. But the principles are the subtail joint is inverted. You need to perform soft tissue release to realign the joint. Next, once the subtail joint is realigned, you'll uncover rigid forefoot pronation, maybe residual hind foot uh, varus. Osteotomies are performed after you've done the best you can to align the subtail joint with soft tissue releases. Next. <coughs> Arthrodesis of the subtail joint is a salvage procedure. I think it is rarely, if ever, indicated, even in older teenagers. Next. And don't be confused by um, cavus. Cavus is a plantar flexion of the forefoot on the hind foot. When we talk about equinus, we're talking about plantar flexion at the ankle. Well, cavus and e ankle equinus are in the same plane. They're in the sagittal plane. In Schwarkham tooth disease, the Achilles tendon is rarely contracted. What looks like a tight Achilles tendon is actually plantar flexion of the forefoot. It's the cavus that's, that's plantar flex, not the ankle. Next. 
Cavus is four foot equinus. It gives the uh, impression of high foot equinus. It, correct the cavus, and you'll often find that what you thought was the tight Achilles tendon is not and does not need to be treated. Whereas if you lengthen the Achilles tendon and and there was no equinus in the ankle, you'll get anterior ankle impingement. So just you have to separate four foot equinus and high foot equinus. Next. <clears throat> We have, we've talked about it so many times. Don't do triples. Next, next, <laughs> next. <coughs> I've, I finally made my first video on how to perform a plantar meter release. We're going into editing now, and I'm going to send it out to the world because every time I take pictures of it like this, it's so obvious to me what a plantar meter release is. The three origins of the abductor hiasis, the plantar fascia, and the short toe flexors, all ways to begin flattening the arch, to begin everting the inverted subtalar joint. It's beautiful anatomy, beautiful dissection, and goes such a long way in aligning the inverted subtalar joint. If the hind foot is flexible, then it's just the abductor release proximally and the plantar release and lengthening of the tibialis posterior. Next. But if the subtalar joint does not correct with the block test, it means that this is not only a superficial plantar medial release that's necessary and lengthening the tibialis posterior, but the tail and orbicular joint needs to be released. This would be like a, a club foot. Remember when we, used, we, when we used to operate on club feet, we'd open the tail and orbicular joint. That's what's necessary if the subtalar joint does not correct with the Coleman block test. Superficial release plus lengthened tip post plus open the tail and orbicular joint. This is first stage. This is what you need to let the skin start stretching. <clears throat> Excuse me, the skin on the plantar medial aspect of the midfoot so that we can then get to the bone operation two weeks later when the skin has had an opportunity to relax by stress relaxation. Next. Most people then treat the pronation of the forefoot that corrects with the plantar medial release, but there's still rigid forefoot pronation, plantar flexion of the first ray. Most people do this with a first metatarsal osteotomy, but that's not the cora. And if you perform an osteotomy away from the cora, you run the risk of next creating a reverse skew foot next next and getting stress transfer lesion to the second metatarsal the first metatarsal osteotomy is is the wrong thing to do you create a deformity you create stress transfer to the second next so it's not the side of deformity next in every standing lateral x-ray of a cavus foot, the cora is in the medial cuneiform. That's the site of deformity. Next. And a plantar-based, next, opening wedge osteotomy, next, of the medial cuneiform, corrects the deformity at the site of deformity. The metatarsals are all kept together. There's no risk of getting stress transfer lesion to the second metatarsal because all the interosseous ligaments have stayed together. And what was a pronation of the forefoot becomes a supination of the forefoot. No stress transfer. You're at the cora. You get rapid incorporation. Even internal fixation isn't required. The graft is inherently stable when you have a mallet and a tamp. Next. <clears throat> Next. And next, next, next. So this is what it looks like. Go back one. And you go, go back, yeah. So <clears throat> that's what it looks like. Again, no, no internal fixation required, and it's a beautiful thing. Next. Is there a role for posterior calcaneus osteotomy? In my training, this was our go-to. I didn't learn everything I just told you so far in my residency. I, I made it up. Um, if you don't correct the subtalar joint first with soft tissue plantar medial release, you would need to cut the posterior calcaneus and move it over two to three centimeters in order to correct hind foot varus. You still wouldn't address the malalignment at the tail and navicular joint, but if you wanted the hind foot to look better from the back, you could slide it over, maybe the full width of the bone. If you perform the plantar medial release first, and then because of the severity of deformity, 
or because the child came so late to see you, you might only have to move it a centimeter. Fast healing, and you're not moving it so much that you get a, a tarsal tunnel syndrome. Next. So here you can see about a centimeter movement. Next. <clears throat> and I also chose in this case to dorsiflex it slightly. You can see how I both translated laterally and dorsiflexed. You can either lower the arch or you can raise the heel. And in this case, I happen to raise the heel a little bit as well. So this is residual. This is clean up what you haven't been able to achieve with the primary soft tissue release. Next. And then now it's going to look like a foot tendon transfers. Next. Choose the right tendon. Next. Move it to the right location. Next. And anchor it at the right tension. Next. The number one deformity in a cable varus foot is pronation of the forefoot. The hind foot, so, and the forefoot pronation becomes rigid before the hind foot does. That's why the Coleman block test is performed, because the hind foot will remain flexible for some time while the forefoot is rigidly pronated. That's the whole basis of, of the Coleman block test. So what pronates the forefoot? The peroneus longus. That's what pronates the forefoot. If you correct the pronation of the forefoot by plantar medial release, medial cuneiform opening by gastiotomy, and leave the perineus longus attached, it will try to recreate the forefoot pronation. So you cut it off. But if you cut it off, <clears throat> then you've wasted power of eversion. The perineals are weak. The posterior tib is strong. So when you release the perineus longus laterally, and you splice it, weave it into the perineus brevis, now the two perineals are functioning only to evert the subtalar joint, not wasting any energy on pronating the forefoot. The two perineals are spliced together, and now they do pure eversion of the subtalar joint against a, tibial, a tibialis posterior that you lengthened two weeks ago. So you lengthen the inverter, weaken the tibialis posterior, you put the perineus longus and brevis together as pure everters, and that balances your hindfoot. This is the best transfer for cable reverse foot deformities. Um, you can also perform others like a split anterior tibial tendon transfer. If there are claw toes, you can do Jones transfers and Hibbs transfers. Like I said, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but the number one most important tendon transfer for progressive cable reverse foot deformities, particularly in, in the Schrockham tooth disease, is transfer of the perineus longus to the perineus brevis. Next. <clears throat> and you have to tell the families, you're treating the result of the problem. You're not treating the problem. With cavalvarous foot deformity, the foot is never the problem. It's the result of the problem, and we can't cure the problem. By correcting deformity and balancing the muscles based on what you feel are the most important transfers, always longus to brevis, maybe something else, you should be able to go for a long time before something else happens, even though they still have the underlying condition. I've operated on about 600 cable various foot deformities with the two-stage reconstructions. And the oldest age kids that I can treat are 21. My hospital only allows me to treat up to age 21. You know, of the 600, I'd say probably less than 5% have I ever had to go back and do another procedure on. So maybe when they're 21 and a half and they get their next operation someplace else, but they don't come back to see me. And I consider that a win. So recurrence of deformity, need for future surgery is possibility. Uh, avoid arthrodesis. You keep more options open for the future, and you don't stress the ankle. Next. I think this is just a summary. So I'll stop there because I think I'm just about, I think I'm just right at an hour. And um, now I will take questions. I guess I could go through the... Uh, through the chats, I see 10 there. Is that is that how we should do it, or what do you think? Yeah, so uh, so let me check here and stop sharing the screen. Okay, so uh, I received a couple of questions, so I'm checking the chat room now if there is questions, and I uh, urge you guys, if you have any questions, to write it down. Uh, so uh, there is a question uh, for a patient with flat feet. Can I know before surgery whether a plantar flexion osteotomy uh, of the medial cuneiform is needed or not? 
or it is an intraoperative decision? Yeah, that's a <clears throat> that's a great question because we can always determine by the Coleman block test. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so we know for the cable bearer's foot, using the Coleman block test, we can predict what we're going to need. But there's no reverse Coleman block test for a flat foot. It's, you're absolutely right. This is an intraoperative decision. And so important. Here's what I do is I correct the hind foot. I'll put my graft in. Usually by then I've already lengthened the heel cord. And I cup the heel in my hand. And I look right down from toe to heel in the foot. So I'm just cupping the heel. There's the leg coming up there. I'm cupping the heel. And I'm, I'm seeing is it pronated or supinated. But it, yes, it's an intraoperative decision. Okay. So uh, another question, uh, would you, uh, is f uh, physical therapy is beneficial for painful, flexible, uh, adolescent flat feet? Um, the, the reason for the pain is the tight tendon Achilles. That, that's the only reason for pain because of the stress that that, that resisted dorsiflexion puts on the foot. So the physical therapy is stretching the heel cord. If, if you can teach your patients how to maneuver their foot into inversion to do a better stretch, then you could do it yourself. Or you could send them to a therapist. But a lot of therapists would need to understand what you all know so well now. All the therapists don't know that about the subtalar joint. It's not so they're not it's not that they're weak. The pain is from a tight heel, uh, heel cord. They need to stretch the heel cord. Okay. Uh, there's another question that uh, goes with the same theme of uh, this, of the physical therapy. Uh, so in cases where younger kids, where there is uh, flat feet, or like we're speaking about seven and eight, uh, and they have uh, a very uh, a full foot abduction and uh, very flat feeted feet, uh, with tightness in the tender Achilles, would you only do lengthening for the tender Achilles just for the sake of that it wouldn't progress? Yeah. Again, really good question. These are these are fantastic questions, everybody. <clears throat> because in the interest of time, there's something called lever arm dysfunction. For, for those of you who treat kids with cerebral palsy, that phrase probably, you, you think about it a lot, the lever arm dysfunction. Lever arm function or dysfunction is related to the strength of the triceps surrey and the length and alignment of the foot. So in a foot that is neutral alignment, where the, where the axis of the foot is perpendicular with the knee, that's the longest lever arm the foot can have, the length of the foot perpendicular with the knee. That being the longest lever, tricep suri, then when power is generated for push off, it's, it's the most power. If the foot is externally rotated, then the length of the foot is no longer, the functional length of the foot is no longer the length of the foot. It's the length from the back of the, from the ankle to the middle of the forefoot. Because the, the effective length of the foot to generate power with the tricep suri is perpendicular with the knee. So if the foot is straight, so here's, here's the knee, <clears throat> here's the foot. If there's external rotation of the foot because of external tibial torsion or because of external rotation through the subtalar joint, the length of the foot is here. It's not here. Okay, so in a flat foot, <clears throat> the thigh foot angle is outward. The effective length of the foot is short. If you lengthen the heel cord, then you have a short lever and a weak muscle, and they can't generate power. You'll weaken them. You might stop the pain, but you'll weaken them because you've created lever arm dysfunction. So, and when, we do, when you do the flat foot reconstruction, you lengthen the heel cord. But what you lose in strength, perhaps, you gain in lengthening the lever arm because you take the externally rotated foot subtalar joint and you make it a long foot again. All right? So flat foot, short lever arm, 
lengthen the heel cord, weak. But if you lengthen the heel cord and correct the rotation of the foot, increase the length of the lever, then they can jump again. Is that clear? Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of questions about the arthroreses and uh, the different techniques and arthroreses. Uh, for uh, maybe some of the, um, the question being asked from uh, our colleagues that they didn't catch uh, your, uh, the beginning of your presentation. Uh, what do you say about the arthroresis? Yeah, so arthroresis has been around since the 1940s, and the, the types of materials that are put in have changed and, and been modified. Sometimes it's a single screw. Sometimes it's a, an implant that goes between the posterior middle facets. The short-term studies <clears throat> show um, good deformity correction, but creation of pain in at least 30% of cases. And in children, the, the bones reabsorb around the implants, creating permanent damage and change to the subtalar joint. Nobody, takes, nobody who does the procedure looks at them in that long-term fashion. Most of the indications for doing it are they, that the docs don't like the shape of the feet, or they say, oh, but it's so much faster than doing the proper operation. And the pain is significant. I've taken out many, many implants. And in some cases, the pain that was created by the implants goes away. And in some cases, it doesn't. And these kids are really disabled. And I don't know what to do for them anymore. It, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real challenge. So there are more studies going on. I'm, I think even more research needs to be done before I could justify it as a technique. Okay, so uh, so uh, there's questions about the, uh, do you uh, ever used uh, a second osteotomy, like a sliding calcaneal osteotomy uh, in addition to the uh, uh, anterior calcaneal lengthening? Yes, it's, it's, I, I'd say, I don't think I've ever done it in, in just an idiopathic flexible flat foot with tight Achilles tendon, but in some of the coalition feet, so they're a little bit different. The calcaneal lengthening will align the tailonavicular joint, but they still have some valgus deformity within the calcaneus bone. So you do the anterior calcaneus first, the calcaneal lengthening osteotomy, align the tailonavicular joint, and then intraoperatively assess the foot and say, is there any residual hindfoot valgus? And if there is, then it's pretty easy to just do the, opposite, the other incision and, and move the calcaneus over. Just to remember that posterior calcaneus osteotomy corrects hind foot valgus, but does not align the telonavicular joint. And that's where the pathology is. So you first do the calcaneal lengthening and, and maybe it's just a flexible flat foot. Intraoperatively, I always do the anterior and then intraoperatively, I look and say, is there any hind foot valgus left? And if so, you can add the, the slide. So, Dr. Yasser, uh, do you have uh, any question in the chat room from your side? Yes, I can see uh, uh, some questions from uh, uh, Professor Khaled al Can you can you check the um, the chat, babe? From who now? Uh, who who are you asking about now? So, uh, uh, so Dr. Khaled Adwar. Uh, so I, I'm I'm running through the questions here. So, uh, uh, so the question: Would you consider the body image of an adolescent with mm -hmm. pain, uh, uh, flat feet, and external? Uh, uh, he sent uh, uh, Dr. I see uh, Dr. Khaled Adwar says that he sent this to. To Moscow. Dr. Khaled, you can send uh, the question on the chat page, please, so we can all read and answer. Okay. I can see uh, Dr. Ashraf Hampur asking, what's the preferred age for arthroreses? Uh, preoperative uh, prerequisite, uh, prerequisites and proper intraoperative growth tips and the tricks. So that's Dr. I, um, Ashraf Kanpur, 1.33 p.m.? Yes. Uh, yes. Please, please. 
is asking what the preferred age for arthrosis and never. the preoperative uh, uh, <laughs> and proper think, intraoperative growth tips. I, I don't think there's an indication for it. I think okay. the only possible indication, possible indication, is for kids who have ligament laxity syndromes. So kids with Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, Down syndrome, their their collagen doesn't allow maintenance of deformity correction. And so if one of the downsides of arthrosis is stiffening of the subtalar joint, which it is, then for kids with ligament laxity syndrome who are not successfully treated with the calcaneal lengthening, that may be the indication for arthrosis is ligament laxity syndromes. But otherwise, I don't think there's an indication for it. That, that's my opinion. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if, you're, if your time can allow more to answer more questions. Oh, yeah, or yeah. Uh, Okay. So uh, I can find the question of, uh, from Professor Mahmoud al -Rusasi. Would you consider the body image of an adolescent with painless plano valgus feet and external foot progression angle without tight Achilles tendon, would you operate on such foot to improve his body image? I, I wouldn't. Even though I have been so pleased with the success of flat foot reconstruction, um, nothing is perfect. And I would hate to take someone who is... I don't think flat foot surgery should be a cosmetic operation. It's a big deal. So I personally wouldn't do it. I, everybody gets to choose what they get to do, but I have never done it for appearance only, only for pain. Okay. Um, another question uh, from uh, Dr. Shadi Abdel Ghaffar. In Beskeva's superficial media release, I feel anatomy is not quite uh, the same in all cases. Do you agree? Also, uh, in medial cuneiform plantar open wedge, uh, can it increase uh, uh, PF tension? And I feel it very difficult to be accessible. Uh, can dorsal closing wedge be substitute? Again, good good question there. I've done, uh, I've done some cadaver work on this and also seen uh, clinically what happens whether you perform opening or closing wedge of the medial cuneiform. Uh, if you, the medial cuneiform is on the medial column of the foot. Medial to the, cuneiform, medial to the medial cuneiform is just skin, fat. Lateral to the medial cuneiform are bones and joints. When one performs an osteotomy of the medial cuneiform, there is always deformity change in the transverse plane. So we're, we're always thinking about the sagittal plane, up or down. But because of bones and joints on the lateral side and skin and soft tissue on the medial side, it's impossible to perform pure dorsiflexion or plantar flexion with an opening or closing wedge. It's impossible. I found this by hopping on hundreds of kids, and then we did a, a cadaver study, and we confirmed. If you, let's just say we want to plantar flex, there's a four-foot supination, and we want to plantar flex the first ray. So if we cut the bone and we put the wedge in from the top, so the base is dorsal, Apex is plantar. If we put the bone wedge in from the top, it will plantar flex the first ray. But because it's tethered laterally, it will also abduct the forefoot. If you plantar flex the first ray by taking the bone out of the bottom, it will plantar flex, but because it's tethered laterally, it will also adduct. And rather than, it's going to be hard using my hands here, <clears throat> but if you can get, if you have access to the POSNA Academy, POSNA Academy, I did a presentation on this very topic a few years ago, showing all the 
And it's also in my book too, but there's also a presentation on showing that <clears throat> you can use that transverse plane deformity to your advantage or disadvantage. If you put the bone in a cable of Eris foot, if you put the bone in from the bottom, it will dorsiflex the pronated forefoot and it will abduct the foot. If in the cable of Eris foot, you take the bone out from the top, it will correct the forefoot pronation, but it will slightly adduct the forefoot. And you're trying to get away from adduction. You want to go the other direction. That's why putting the bone in from the bottom will dorsiflex the ray and abduct versus the, the opposite. So again, it's hard with my hands, but um, if you could look at that Posen Academy talk that I gave, uh, I think it's accessible to everybody. Uh, or, or it's in my book, uh, Considering the Other Plane. Okay. Um, thank you. And uh, now Dr. Khaled, uh, uh, Professor Khaled Edward asked this question. How, how do you uh, counsel parents whose children have ligamentous laxity when you plan to do calcaneal lengthening in flat feet? Yeah, and that's what I was saying. I, 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 I just tell them it, it might not work, but there aren't too many options. Um, I've considered, and I have on two occasions, put the arthrosis implants in, but it's only two occasions. And, and it, so far, it's been successful. They haven't had pain from it, but the risk is 30%, so I've only done two. <laughs> uh, it, what I found, though, is that in the really ligament laxity kids, they often get flat again, but they don't hurt. So they were very flat and they hurt. Calcaneal lengthening, they look great at the end of the operation. Over the next few months, they flatten again, but they usually don't hurt. They just get somewhat flat again. And so we accomplished what we wanted was to stop the pain. Okay. Uh, here's another question. Would you not give severe flat feet uh, an arch support without tightness of Achilles tendon to prevent the progression? I think, I, I think that's reasonable. I don't know of any research on it. But if you get the kids early, so what are the, the advantages of an, of an orthosis in a child with a flexible flat foot without a tight Achilles tendon is that the shoes don't get worn out very fast, <laughs> is that it preserves the, the life of the shoes. Uh, in Kiva's foot, should uh, uh, bear longest to uh, should peroneus longus to peroneus brevis be accompanied by distal sectioning of uh, peroneus longus or not necessary? Oh, <clears throat> so I, I I cut the peroneus longus like a Z, and then the proximal part is what gets woven into the brevis, and the distal part is just let let go. Okay. In, in rigid flat foot, you suggest the calcaneal lengthening uh, result in deformity correction. In un, um, I understood that you implied that this happened through a uh, Schuppert uh, joint. Can uh, Schuppert joints, can this not uh, risk in uh, CC subluxation after removing uh, the, K the K wire as a subtalar is stiff? No. The, 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 there's been a lot of there have been a lot of papers lately about the, the calcaneal cuboid joint, and I, I've commented to the authors that um, they continue to do research, but they're missing the point. The point of the wire is to prevent subluxation at the, at the time of distracting the osteotomy. I think it's reasonable once the osteotomy is distracted, the wire could probably be removed because the acetabulum pedis is gone where it's supposed to go. I leave it in for six weeks, but the point is to keep the joint from subluxating at the time of the forceful distraction. Um, and then when the wire comes out, it, it doesn't shift anymore. It, it stays right where you put it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question from... Uh, Dr. Osama Shabana, when definitely I operate accessory navicular? Accessory navicular? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
<clears throat> about 13% of people have, in this, 13 to 15% of people have accessory navicularis. Most of them don't hurt. They all have a bump, but most of them don't hurt. So if a child's been very active and they have pain, I recommend that they try to just change activities, go swimming, ride bicycles, instead of doing whatever else they were doing, and see if the inflammation in the synchondrosis can resolve. I don't know how successful that is, <clears throat> but I, I at least have them try it just to settle things down. The reason that most of them will not heal is that a painful accessory navicular, the synchondrosis is cartilage. That's what it means. It's, it's cartilage. And cartilage doesn't have very good blood supply. So if there's a stress fracture through the synchondrosis, it's probably not going to heal. But at least I, I make some effort to, to settle down, just see if they can feel better. And if they can't, then it's a very successful operation to remove the coalition. Okay. Can we ask uh, uh, one more question? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it's still early. Maybe, it's early uh, in the maybe day. the last it's one. Or it's, 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 two o'clock. it's two o'clock in the afternoon here. You guys, it's nighttime. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, one question from Ahmed Umran. I have observed post-operatively in a few cases of cavovarus feet that also the column Uh, the, col uh, the colman test was positive preoperatively and the cavus is corrected by soft tissue release and the forefoot bone osteotomy. The child walked postoperatively in supination. What could be the explanation? Wait a minute, I didn't... Um, where, where was that question? Maybe I can read it. Okay. I have observed postoperatively in a few cases of cavovarus feet that although the Coleman test was positive preoperatively uh, pre and the cavus is corrected by soft tissue release and the four, feet, uh, four foot bone osteotomy, uh, the child walked postoperatively in supination. What could be the explanation? That they, they walked in supination. <laughs> yeah, so that... And... Um, So the tibialis anterior is too strong. So that that might, so if I'm understanding the question, <clears throat> it could be that the tibialis anterior is very strong and the perineus tertius is weak. And so one might then consider, again, if I'm interpreting properly, one might consider doing a split anterior tibial tendon transfer so that instead of the tibialis anterior only supinating, it also dorsiflexes and everts. Is that, do you think, is that, would that be a reasonable answer? Is to do a split anterior tibial? Yes, sir, do you think? Yes, sir, what do you say? So do you think that a split anterior tibial tendon transfer would prevent the supination because there's more power on the lateral column? I, I think, just a second. A lot of good questions here. Um, uh, yeah, there is a question as well uh, as regarding the age of the anterior calcaneal lengthening. Uh, do you have like a certain age that you would think about the anterior calcaneal lengthening beyond this or below it that you wouldn't offer to your patients? Yeah, it's completely made up, but I like, the, I like age eight. The children have most of the growth behind them. And I'm sure that they need the operation, which is most important. So I, I pick around age eight or, over, or older. Okay. Um, there is one question. Is physiotherapy, is, uh, is physiotherapy beneficial in painful, flexible adolescent flat feet? Only, I mean, if... Instead of surgery, like I said, the only physical therapy would be stretching the heel cord. After surgery, they've been in cast for eight weeks, so I send them to physical therapy just to get strong again quickly. Okay, there is a question that I have it as well. So uh, when, uh, when you're uh, telling about the uh, medial cuneiform osteotomy, sometimes I found when I do this osteotomy, it doesn't <clears throat> move or it doesn't close 
uh, as much as I'm looking for it. Yeah. Uh, do you have any track for this? Yes. <clears throat> now, I'm really feeling bad now. I, I didn't have time. <laughs> I would love to put some asides in. Again, on the medial column, there's nothing there. The medial cuneiform is just skin, fat, bone. On the lateral side, the second metatarsal to middle cuneiform joint is um, slightly distal to the mid-body of the medial cuneiform. So you got the medial cuneiform, and it would be nice if we could cut the medial cuneiform right in the middle to either open or close. The second metatarsal middle cuneiform joint is slightly distal to halfway along the medial cuneiform. So if you cut perpendicular with the mid, mid body of the medial cuneiform, you will be proximal to the next joint. I angle my osteotomy slightly distal so that when the osteotomy ends laterally, it's adjacent to the second metatarsal middle cuneiform joint. All right? So the, we, we call the second metatarsal the keystone because all the other tarsal metatarsal joints are, are, are in an arc, except for the second one in which the second metatarsal is inset. So we call that a keystone. It's like a, uh, it's the key. Actually, it, it comes from architecture. If you start your osteotomy in the medial cuneiform, medial cuneiform, and cut just perpendicular, you will not end adjacent to that joint. But if you start halfway along the medial column and angle slightly 10, 15 degrees distal, you will end adjacent. You'll be right at the second metatarsal middle cuneiform joint. So if you've created an osteotomy next to a joint, and that frees up everything. That okay. frees up everything. If you if you don't, but you stop, and you're adjacent to the middle, some part of the middle cuneiform, all the interosseous ligaments are preventing that. So your observation is, is right; it just doesn't move very much. But if you create it ending right at that second joint, you'll have all the mobility you need. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm, I could, I'm running uh, through the questions and. Uh, uh, so I'm trying to just not to skip any of the questions. Uh, sorry, guys, if I'm skipping any or trying, I'm trying to find all the questions, try to answer it. Uh, and oh, I see, I see a question actually, and okay. uh, about the perineal spastic flat foot. Yes. yes, nobody knows what that is. Harrison Beeth, again, the Canadians who told us all about flat feet in 1945, said that about 9% of the 23% of flat-footed patients, uh, their, their soldiers in their study, 9% of the 23% had rigid flat feet. Of the rigid flat feet, 88% had tarsal coalitions, and 12% and they didn't have a coalition. So that's what a perineal spastic flat foot is. It should be a coalition. And, and nobody has been able to understand what it is or how to treat it. And it's coming on now 75 years, and we still don't understand what it is, why it is, or how to treat it. It's, it's a real problem. In the United States, we usually see these perineal spastic flat feet in obese adolescents. And, um, and in fact, I think it's, actually, it's more common in African-American obese adolescents than Caucasians. But they, they all look alike. They're just really, really fat kids. Um, so we don't know what it is. It's my impression that when we get MRI scans on them, trying to figure out, you know, where's the pain? They all have inflammation in the sinus tarsi between the lateral process of the talus and the critical angle of Gisain. So where the lateral process meets um, laterally, there's a lot of inflammation there on the, on the MRI. And I believe that these really heavy kids are just crushing their feet because they're carrying two bodies on two feet <laughs> instead of two bodies on four feet. Um, 
but that said, it, it isn't. There, there's no good studies on saying how to manage them. You know, we try conservative. We try injections. We try all all kinds of stuff. Gabapentin, everything. It it isn't. There's no consistent way to manage them. So that's all I can say. They're a problem. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Mosca, uh, I would like to thank you very, very much uh, for your very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, we are very, very glad today to, to have you with us and uh, with more than uh, 130 participants. Uh, it's uh, really very impressive uh, webinar. We, uh, we are very glad to organize this one. Uh, I would like to thank very much uh, Dr. Khaled Zaglul for his effort uh, uh, to our Egyptian Pediatric Orthopedic Society. Uh, Dr. Mosca, thank you very, very, very much for your uh, precious, really very precious time. We value this uh, too much. Thank, thank you. Well, thank, uh, you, thank you, yes, sir. And uh, Khaled, my, my really good friends, um, I, I, I'm sad for the passing of your, your colleague. He, he left us much too soon, Dr. Taraf. Um, uh, I'm glad I still have the opportunity to interact with you, and I hope it will be in person uh, again yeah. um, there or here or someplace in the world. Uh, we're, we're going to get back to seeing each other <laughs> in person. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. I, I feel honored, and I'm, I'm happy to share um, what, I, what I've worked on for a long, long career. <laughs> so, so thank you once again, and hope to see you uh, around the world someplace. Thank you. Thank inshallah, you. Will. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Go to say thank inshallah. You. Thank you. And uh, uh, we'll have this uh, webinar recorded, uh, and uh, it will be on uh, uh, YouTube and uh, uh, social media and LinkedIn. So you will find it, inshallah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.